Israeli police raided the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem, injuring hundreds of worshippers. Now, of those injured, according to the Palestinian Red Crescent, at least seven are in a critical condition. Many more are in, are in hospital. Now, the raid sparked widespread outcry because of the significance of the mosque, which is considered the third holiest site in Islam. Footage of the raid has been widely shared on social media, with police using stun grenades and rubber-covered metal bullets to clear worshippers from the site. This is the third night that Israeli police and soldiers have attacked people praying there. So why is this happening now? Well, the raids were thought to be an attempt by Israeli authorities to clear the holy site before a march by right-wing Zionists that was due to take place. And um, that was the annual Jerusalem Day March. It marks the date that Israel began its illegal capture and occupation of East Jerusalem following the 1967 war. As far as I understand, in the end, um, that didn't go forward. Um, the raid also takes place off the back of days of protests against the eviction of Palestinian families in Sheikh Jarrah, a neighborhood in East Jerusalem. Um, there, Palestinians are being expelled from their homes to make way for Jewish settlers. It's a practice which has been ongoing in the city for decades. Um, when it comes to, to that particular dispute or, or that uh, eviction, there was another video which has gone really, really viral recently, which is an interaction which really shows the power dynamics at play in those, in those evictions. Jacob, you know this is not your house. Yes, but if I go, you don't go back. So what's the problem? Why are you yelling at me? I didn't do this. I yeah. didn't do this. But but you're you're not it's you're... easy to yell at me, but I didn't do this. Yeah, you are helping. stealing my house. And if I don't steal it, someone else is going to steal it. No, no one, no one uh, is allowed to steal it, Yammi. Really appalling, which is why, you know, that traveled far because of just how outrageous that was. And there is one more outrage currently ongoing in Jerusalem, which frames the storming of of Al-Aqsa. This is or the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Um, this is the ongoing violent attempt by Israeli police to stop Palestinians gathering at the city's Damascus gates during Ramadan. This Sky report gives an idea of the context there. These steps are steps which uh, Palestinians uh, who live in this part of East Jerusalem gather in for Ramadan when their fast comes to an end each evening. They gather on these steps. Uh, and what we have seen tonight has been the same uh, for the past few nights. F for, for no logical reason, the Israeli police are moving in and in a very blunt way controlling, as they say, the crowd, a crowd which doesn't, uh, as far as we've seen, need any control. Yeah, the These are families. Is. Yep, lots of young people as well, young boys uh, here too, uh, who are uh, at the end of their Ramadan fast are gathering here. We've seen uh, over the course of the evening, water cannon filled with a rancid skunk, as it's known, uh, is, um, is sprayed at people, sprayed a little bit earlier on at, at uh, young boys who were gathered up at the wall here. Again, rancid water being sprayed at people who were just gathering after praying. You know, it's, it's horrible to watch. Um, to discuss the raid on the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the repression at the Damascus Gates, I spoke earlier to Akram Salhab, a Palestinian from Jerusalem who is currently based there. And this is part of the Israelis' Uh, broader policy of attempting to change the, the character of Jerusalem and indeed to change the character of the country as a whole. Um, Israeli settler colonial policies since Israel's inception have been designed to get the maximum amount of land with the minimum number of Palestinians on that land. As with all settler colonial projects, that take place, takes place in a variety of ways. And what we've seen in Jerusalem is an attempt to change over time the demographic makeup of the city. And the important background to this is that, you know, we'll talk about different kinds of policies, land confiscation, house demolitions, um, the discriminatory planning, the revocation of Palestinian um, residency rights in Jerusalem. But what happens around Ramadan and Easter, which has just been Orthodox Easter here in Jerusalem, is that the Israeli state, despite all of um, what it's been doing over the past um, years in Jerusalem, 
cannot change the fact that when it comes to Ramadan or when it comes to Easter, it's very clearly a Palestinian Arab city. Um, all of the streets are filled with Palestinians. All the shops are open. Palestinian music, uh, Arab music, Arabic music is playing. And Palestinians are out in huge numbers throughout the city. And it's very clear that we have a presence in this city. And despite everything they've attempted to do, we're still here and we're still standing up for our rights and we still have our claims to sovereignty. And what, um, and this is what, this is what Israel cannot stand. And so everything that's brought us up to this point has been an attempt to them by the Israeli authorities to destroy any Palestinian public presence in the city. Firstly, by putting barriers at Damascus Gate. So Palestinians would often, after Iftar, would go and sit at Damascus Gate and have shisha pipes or hang out or dance or just spend time there. Um, or wander up Salah Haddin Street, which is where um, many Palestinian businesses and shops are located. The Israelis put barriers at Damascus Gate, which prevented people from sitting there. And that was the first, that's what began the, and in Palestinians rejecting that was what began the first confrontations that happened during um, Ramadan. The Israeli authorities also attacked Palestinian Christians going into um, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. They wouldn't allow them in, and they were beating families, children, um, and others trying to get in to pray on Orthodox Easter. Um, and on Orthodox Easter, Palestinian Christians are different um, uh, branches of uh, uh, Christianity, which are represented in it, walk up and down with scout groups in the old city, filling it with music and sound and an obvious presence of Palestinians being there. And this, again, is not something the Israelis are willing to um, sit by and, and let happen. So as well as their claim to sovereignty and as well as a forcible transfer of people, they want to make sure that Palestinians feel cowed, feel marginalized, and don't feel they can assert themselves or have, or have any presence at all um, in the city. You described very effectively there how what we're witnessing now fits into a logic of settler colonialism. I mean, in terms of recent history, are we seeing, is what we're seeing now the norm and it's just that the international media attention is, is more on it? Or is there something exceptional about what, what, what's going on now? And if the latter, why are we seeing this ramping up of repression? Um, well, I think actually what's happened over the past few weeks has to be interpreted as something very positive. Because everything that I've described is happening in Jerusalem every single day, every single week every single month of every single year since Israel began its occupation of the city. And it changes in um, speed or direction, but it continues in one inexorable, uh, towards one inexorable aim, which is the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians from the city. So it's much better that we have moments where Palestinians are resisting that rather than that happen in silence, you know, with the international community, quote unquote, having their attention elsewhere. And the Palestinian resistance to that is cowed by arrests, by um, other repressive measures in the city. So it's much better um, that what we're able, uh, the, the Palestinians in the city are able to confront this. And what's happened over the past few days, now the past few weeks, is that we've seen the entire city rise up in the most extraordinary way. If you walk down the streets, you see every single street corner, police and soldiers, but young men standing defiantly, standing their ground, you see um, people singing in the streets. You see people doing debke at the entrances to the old city. The other day, the Israelis attempted to prevent Palestinians from inside um, uh, Palestine, 1948 Palestine, from coming to pray at uh, or during Laysal Qadr, which is uh, the most holy night of Ramadan, which is a few evenings ago. The Israelis prevented them from coming, and they, they got off their buses, and they started walking towards Jerusalem, and Palestinians from the... Um, from Jerusalem went to collect them in their cars and bring them here. You've seen this enormous explosion, this civic spirit across the city with people from all walks of life out in force and saying that we have a right to be here and saying that we, whatever happens, we're going to fight for that, uh, for our right, because the alternative is a complete expulsion and ethnic cleansing and ending of our way of life in this city. So actually what we've seen is an incredibly positive response to something that's continued in different ways and through different means by the Israelis throughout the entirety of their occupation and indeed to all Palestinian areas since um, its, its inception in 1948. So um, I think we have to definitely regard this as an incredibly positive thing. And I don't think it represents an escalation by the Israelis whatsoever. It's just a, a continuation of the same policy, sometimes ramping things up, sometimes slowing them down 
as they see their opportunities in the international arena develop and change. That was Akram Salhab speaking to me from Jerusalem. I also spoke today to Muna Dijani, who is currently based in London, but who has family at risk of eviction in Sheikh Jurras. That's the community whom I was talking about before who are at risk of, of being evicted by by Jewish settlers. Now, the community of Sheikh Jarrah is, is largely made up of families who were resettled in Jerusalem by the UN and the Jordanian government in 1956 after having been expelled from the city during the Nakba in 1948. There are now hundreds of Palestinian families living in Sheikh Jarrah. Um, when I spoke to Muna, um, she began by e explaining to me and the historical context which explains why those homes are now under threat. 1967, the Six Day War happened again. Israel occupied the rest of Palestine, and today, Palestinians there, Palestinian Jerusalemites, found, them, found themselves mere residents of a city that they belong to. Uh, and being a mere resident means that you don't have citizenship rights, you're under military occupation. But you are confronted with a new uh, lexicon and a new way of, of living in the place. And what happened uh, a few years after the Six Day War is that the residents of Sheikh Zarga, uh, the, the this compound we talk about, they started receiving lawsuits filed against them by settler organizations uh, claiming that uh, this land uh, is, is theirs, uh, is the ownership of the settler organization, and that uh, the Palestinian families uh, are there unlawfully. And of course, the all, all the Palestinian residents of Sheikh Jarrah are rightful owners of, of, of their houses. I remember being a child hearing about the looming threat of evictions from the from the 1980s, we've been hearing about uh, about these lawsuits against us, but always with the hope that we shall prevail because our evidence is very clear that we belong to this uh, land, we belong to Sheikh Jarrah, and we have all the evidence to show that. The, the Israeli court system has always dismissed our evidence uh, and, and taken the side of the Israeli settlers, who, although their evidence has never has been nullified, it has been uh, really shown to be forged. Sheikh Jarrah connects different Palestinian uh, communities and neighborhoods of East Jerusalem. It is kind of the, our, our like anchor, our heart, the heart of the city of Jerusalem. So the fact that we are today witnessing a court decision that has, uh, that has been decided to, to evict us from our house is totally, uh, totally illegal decision. And uh, we're trying all our best to, to con confront it, contest it, whether, uh, whether through, through these courts being on the ground, uh, and seeing how the J Jerusalem residents have been protecting the city in all their might, whatever they can do, being being there, being present, uh, and making a point, uh, reaching out on social media. That was Muna Jajani speaking um, about the evictions in Sheikh Jarrah. Um, Dalia, I want to go to you quickly for your for your thoughts on on what we've just heard in that section. This is the problem, isn't it, with the stigmatization of anyone in public life who cares about internationalism. Um, and I think that, you know, especially looking at the show that we've had today and, and sort of finishing with these scenes and finishing with, you know, what Akram and, and Muno were just saying. And, and, you know, after we've just talked about, you know, how with this Labour Party stuff, how it feels like we as sort of young, precarious people are getting so aggressively pushed out of po political decision making um, and so pushed out of power. When when you hear about um, the resistances in Sheikh Jarrah to these kinds of to these evictions um, and that long history of 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 um, of, of fighting back, um, it makes me think that we just don't have an option um, but to have hope and and to resist, um, you know, if if the the residents of Sheikh Jarrah can can fight in the face of literal dispossession, you know, dispossession that has the backing of local courts, of local army, of the state, um, then then we have to, you know, hope is not a a a feeling, it's not an emotion, and we can't rely on hope only when we feel it. It's a virtue and it's a duty. Um, to which we are, which we are bound, and I think, as well, you know, the reason that these kinds of moments hold such significance for so many people is because it represents, in such explicit terms, um, a phenomenon that is true for so many oppressed people around the world. Um, it demonstrates how, you know, through bureaucratic means, through cultural means, through economic, militaristic, geographic techniques, you know, as Akram uh, outlined. 
um, entire communities can be stripped of their personhood and they can be subjected to the sharpest edges of violence, of state violence. Um, and, you know, what, what we see through things like the clearing of public space from markers of Arab culture or Palestinian culture, the denying of planning permissions to um, Palestinian residents and then turning around and saying, well, you know, you're here illegally so we can evict you. Um, it's it's so this is you know one of many of the many clarifying lenses through which we can understand how entire communities are dehumanized and are stripped of their personhood and then all manners of violence against them can be justified but it's also close to the hearts of so many people because of the insistence on living in the face of that um on the insistence on hoping and creating um in the face of that kind of struggle so it's the story of so many self-determination struggles around the world. It's the story of communities that insist on their own humanity in the face of dehumanization, in the face of their humanity being stripped away. And that is why I think it's so important to focus on the fact that um, there is a poetic and there is an ethic of, of hope in the face of that. And so we, we don't have a choice, um, especially here in the UK, to abdicate. On, on our responsibility of, of protecting those who are the most marginalized from political life.